before you've had time to grasp the fact they've been turned round and you're watching them take off again. But despite the fact that they don't seem to spend much time on the ground, even jet aircraft have to be garaged sometimes. And building a home for something the size of one of those presents quite a roofing problem. But how about building a hangar for a jumbo jet? The Boeing 747, designed to carry 410 passengers at a cruising speed of 600 miles an hour. This model VC-10 is built to the same scale, so it gives some idea of the vast proportions of the jumbo. In fact, the 747 is 230 feet long, with a wingspan of 195 feet, and a tail plane 65 feet high. BOAC wanted a hangar to house two of them side by side. Uh, a hangar for two of these monsters has to be 450 feet wide and 240 feet long with no internal roof supports or columns, a clear span. You need a pretty big lid for a box like that. And it's quite a design problem. All the same, it's by no means a new problem. The Victorians managed to build structures with big clear spans like this. St. Pancras Station, a vast monument to the Victorian era. It was designed by William Barlow in the early 1860s and opened on October the 1st, 1868. It's a clear span of 245 feet, a classical Gothic arch of great nobility and elegance, but heavy. A network of iron girders supports the roof. Heavy girders, each rib weighing over 50 tons. In those days, to build big was to build heavy. But nevertheless, the Victorians were experts in handling their media. Here, at Temple Meads in 1878, the designer was able to create a roof curved in two directions, an arch curved lengthwise into the bargain. No trouble at all if you could afford the labour and plant to handle the girders. It took 6,000 men several years to build the whole complex of St Pancras, and heaven knows how many blacksmiths were involved in the erection of this roof. But the modern designer usually has other problems to deal with as well. For instance, the question of heating costs. An arch roof like St. Pancras has a large structural volume, mostly wasted volume. So this type of design would involve considerable running costs if it were necessary to keep the building heated. Of course, with St. Pancras itself, the problem didn't arise. Keeping the passengers warm wasn't part of Barlow's brief, and the large roof volume was probably intended to take the steam and smoke from the trains. But, with the hangar for the jumbo jet, the situation was rather different. There, the internal temperature had to be kept at 68 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. From an economic point of view, this meant that the structural volume of the hangar roof had to be kept as small as possible. So we couldn't give it a roof like some bankers, even though today this could probably be done quite cheaply. No, we had to find another way. And steam tube could provide an answer. For which steel tube, big no longer means heavy in structural terms. Now, instead, it means elegant, spacious, in the style of the 20th century. Structural hollow sections, whether square, rectangular, or circular, have all the properties of other steels, strength, reliability, durability, but they have additional features owing to their shape. Excellent qualities in compression and torsion, lightness, or rather a high strength to weight ratio that enables the designer to make use of light sections and create light structures. Low wind resistance and a small surface area for minimum maintenance. And by no means least, clean lines. These properties of structural hollow sections are used to great advantage in lattice girders. With lattice girders, it becomes possible to cover wide spans with roofs of small structural depth. Take the case of Pea Shed in the Port of London. Here, the requirement was for a transit shed, 
a temporary store for perishable materials. These show the completed job. 575 feet long, 150 feet wide, with a 30-foot canopy. The materials are unloaded from ships at the quay and eventually transported away by lorries. All the materials handling is done by forklift truck. At the design stage, this need to use forklift trucks extensively in the building made a clear span structure desirable. At the dock side, a headroom of 21 feet gave sufficient clearance for the forklift trucks, but at the other side, a headroom of 31 feet was needed for the lorries. This led quite logically to a flat roof having a gentle slope from one side to the other. 150 foot clear span with a 30 foot weather protection canopy for the lorries extending beyond it as part of the same structure, cantilevered. A tubular lattice girder was chosen as the most economical way of meeting all the requirements. The efficiency of hollow sections is such that the girder need only have a small depth to do the job. The slope is sufficient to carry away rainfall and drainage is very simple and the roof cladding is ordinary metal sheeting. The roof is supported on vertical lattice girders at the dock side and pinned column supports at the roadside. The result is a large column-free floor area in a building with a clean-cut roof. The main beams of the girders use 10 and 3 quarter inch tube and are placed at 50 foot centers. The purlins are propped to give greater rigidity and to assist in stabilizing the girders themselves. This arrangement makes for maximum economy of material and results in a roof of considerable aesthetic appeal. But of course, there's more than one design for lattice girders. And more than one purpose they can serve. In every case, tubular girders provide a high strength to weight ratio, and this enables designers to make use of lighter sections. So saving material, creating space, and producing structures of great elegance. Graceful curves can add beauty to any structure. And another advantage of steam too is that curves can readily be fabricated using standard equipment. Some spans are so large that the girders must be broken down to lengths suitable for road transport. These girders, each of which spans 120 feet, were prefabricated in three 40-foot sections and site welded, though site bolting is also possible. Prefabrication of much bigger sections is feasible. Of course, as the span increases, the cost per square foot usually goes up as well. But the differences in cost are often surprisingly small. And with a clear span, you have the immeasurable advantage of flexibility. The flexibility of uninterrupted floor space and freedom of interior planning, which is so essential in many modern industrial buildings. But there's a limit to what you can do with lattice girders in flat room construction. A limit to the spans which are feasible. Beyond 300 feet, they become difficult to handle, difficult to transport, and it's impossible to keep their structural volume small without risk of excessive deflection. And if, as is sometimes the case, roof volume is no object, a somewhat cheaper way to obtain such spans is by means of an arch or dome with which it's possible to span up to 1,000 feet. Another way would be to use a barrel vault. This is M shed in the Port of London. It's a transit shed, 530 feet long and 145 feet wide with a cantilevered canopy at the roadside. The need to use forklift trucks here made a clear span desirable, and the architect achieved this with a series of seven barrel vaults strung together. There are no supporting columns between the vaults. The valley sections joining two adjacent barrels are small triangulated girders. 
The vaults themselves comprise eight prefabricated panels of identical construction, and these were welded together in situ. The main longitudinal members are connected side by side. All members in the grid are rectangular hollow sections of small size. In the terms we're considering, it's not a big span, but the choice of this design in this material, allowing the use of such light sections, has resulted in a structure of great interest. A big advantage of the barrel vault is that any number of them can be strung together to cover a large area, whereas one vault on its own is a perfectly valid structure, spanning in two directions. But more often than not, especially in industrial buildings, roof volume and heating costs are important considerations. And the only way to cover a big clear span with a roof of small structural depth using prefabricated components is to create a space structure. Space structures may be considered as frameworks extended into three dimensions. Simple triangulated units built up into complex patterns. Forces normally distributed in two directions branch out omnidirectionally into space and are balanced in this way, forming a homogeneous field without peak loads. The distribution of stress is even, and the resultant rigidity is so great that there's a tremendous improvement in the spans which can be achieved. The boundaries lie in the ingenuity of architects and designers. Obviously then, space frame construction was worth considering in the case of the jumbo jet hangar. After all, a space frame could easily span the required 450 feet at a reasonably small roof depth so that heating costs would be kept down. And remember, the inside of the hangar has to be kept at a controlled temperature, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. But would this have been the sensible way to do it? In fact, not. A normal double layer grid space frame roof would have to be erected high enough to accommodate the tail plane, which stands considerably higher than the rest of the aircraft. For most of the hangar, the ceiling would be unnecessarily high, resulting in a huge useless volume, which would nevertheless add to the cost of maintaining that control temperature. The logical answer seemed to be a two-level roof. A high ceiling to accommodate the tail plane and a lower ceiling for the rest of the aircraft. The two levels joined by a deep girder with a smaller girder at the front to take the doors. The final solution went one better than this. It comprised a folded plate, two-layer diagonal grid structure in which the upper and lower grids were integrated continuously with the grids forming the spine and fascia girders. The spine girder was erected first. Top and bottom booms connected by 16 cruciforms. The girder stands 48 feet high. While work continued on the spine girder, the smaller fascia girder began to take shape. Here, the bracings formed simple triangles to give the girder a depth of 27 feet on an overall length of 620 feet. All main wells were checked by radiographic examination and branch wells by other means, including the ultrasonic method. Both main girders were a 450 foot clear span. But because the fascia girder has to take the sliding doors of the hangar, end sections, fabricated separately, had to be added on. beginning on the low-level space frame behind the spine girder. It showed the economy of this kind of construction. Small, prefabricated sections, easily handled and erected, were joined together to form a structure 450 feet wide and 200 feet long, with a depth of a mere 12 feet. Once construction of the fascia girder had been completed, the girder was raised 30 feet clear of the ground so that its top boom was level with that of the spine girder.
only when this had been done could work begin on the high-level space frame. The design of this route required computer analysis, owing to the complex loads which the route has to carry. As well as 600 tons of service loading, it also has to take 200 tons of moving equipment. Despite these heavy loads and the shallow depth of the roof, the great structural stiffness of the continuous grid helps to keep vertical deflections within the required limits. And so the roof began to take its final shape. One massive task remained. To raise the entire roof structure, partly clad and already carrying much of its service load, to its final position. A lift of 50 feet for a total weight of 2,500 tons. Beginning. 